This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on October 5th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, Vincent. Hello, everyone. It's a short turnaround, but I thought, given the state of the president, we should chat. Last we spoke was Thursday evening, Daniel. We didn't know anything about uh, Donald Trump's uh, SARS-CoV-2 status. Uh, then we learned Friday, and a lot has happened. So I thought we would talk about it. Yeah, this this is I, I agree. I'm I'm certain our listeners have a lot of questions, and hopefully, this is somewhere where they can come and get some um, clarity, some scientific clarity on what's going on and what we know. Right. I thought that uh, you would be the perfect person to do that, Daniel. Let's let's talk about you know the clinical course and what treatments uh, he's been getting, starting from you know he he reported that he was PCR positive on Friday. Is that correct? So, um, yeah, uh, there's two, uh, probably two things we want to talk about. And I think that um, it's fine to talk um, about the clinical course first. And I think that makes sense. Um, a lot of people as um, well has been sort of communicated in the in the press um, are a little bit confused about the exact timeline. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I think a lot of us, yeah, we it's not clear to me. It's not clear to a lot of us. Um, you know, what the exact uh, sequence was and where we are. Um, so the initial report, right, was that um, there was a test done on Thursday. Um, it came back as sort of an initial, well, like that indeterminate, an initial positive. A mm -hmm. second test was done to clarify that this was really true. Um, and then there was, I believe, a 1 a.m. tweet. Yes, I tested positive. And, and that was sort of the initial um, uh, report that we had. From that, we don't, we can't assume that that is when he got infected. Of course, he may have been infected quite a ways before that, right? Well, I think I think that's something that's very clear. So um, the president was, you know, if you have a positive test on, um, call it the wee hours Thursday night, um, you know, you were infected um, on average, um, you know, about a week before that. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, you may not get a test, you know, the moment you start to have symptoms. You know, in the case of um, the president, right? And to give him the benefit of the doubt, he's a busy guy. He's flying around different time zones, right? Um, you know, it's hard to know. When did you start feeling tired? <laughs> it's like I've been tired for three and a half years. Um, so at some point, he was uh, perhaps more tired um, than he'd been before that at some point. And this is going to be hard, right, for um, the physician of the president. It's hard for me a lot of times to pin down with each individual patient when was the actual disease onset? When was that initial viral phase? And um, not only is it difficult, but I always, I always say the hardest um, uh, bit of data to get, the least reliable bit of data to get, but the most important information to get is the history. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly in COVID-19, um, where it really helps us in understanding not only what to expect with the disease, but what therapeutics to be thinking about, um, when the disease started, um, and where you are kind of in that um, in that period. I remember I texted you early Friday morning, and you said you thought he uh, had a, had a sore throat and was people said he was tired, so you thought he might be in the viral phase at that point, right? Yeah, that's that's what it sounded like. At least the initial reports, you know, I, I texted you that that the binary, you know, we're trying to figure out first off the bat, is this going to be an asymptomatic infection or an mm -hmm. infection with symptoms? And at least by Friday morning, we already had an indication that this was going to be a symptomatic infection. And, and I think that that has become clarified. Yes, the president has a symptomatic infection. Um, and then the question, and still we don't know the timing, and I think that that's going to be um, a little bit tricky here. One of the things um, we know about as far as phases, and I'm going to sort of get our listeners up to speed on this, um, but also some of the TWIV co-hosts, because sometimes I feel like maybe I haven't been as, as good as I should have been in laying the phases out for everyone. Um, 
um, because there's overlap. It's not like, you know, you close a door in one phase and go into the next. And, and I have this beautiful diagram, actually, maybe I'll publish it at some point, but I use it in a lot of my talks where I show that there's really an overlap between these phases. There's the initial viral phase, um, which is that first week, but the virus then is on its way down as we enter into the cytokine storm phase, that second week. Um, and it's during that second week when people start requiring oxygen, when they start having trouble breathing. And there really, there tends to be this progression that I know we've talked about where first your oxygen level drops below 90. Um, that's usually at the point where we look at giving people supplemental oxygen. This can be followed by an increase in the respiratory rate. Um, and then at any point during this period of time, this second week, we worry that a patient, you know, we've used the word decompensate where they quickly require higher amounts of oxygen, more supportive therapy. Um, but right at that point, when we start looking at, you know, considering steroids, when we start escalating the amount of oxygen, um, that's right at the point when the hypercoagulable phase begins. Um, early on, we observed clinically the clot complications, the thromboembolic complications during week three, but those clots are starting to form um, during that second week. And actually, um, I think we believe that that's part of that decompensation. Um, it's not just cytokines, um, but these cytokines are also triggering tiny little um, clots in the pulmonary um, vasculature. I think in the case, the president was given aspirin, um, an antiplatelet agent mm -hmm. um, that might, you know, potentially address some of the concerns that we have with the um, increased clotting that occurs with COVID-19. As far as we know, all treatment began on Friday, do you think? Um, that's what we've been told. We were told that Friday afternoon, um, his initial treatment um, was with uh, the monoclonal um, antibody cocktail. Um, coincidentally, that you and I discussed on Thursday <laughs> night, I thought that was appropriate. Um, and uh, the Regeneron um, antibody cocktail is really, I mean, fascinating from a science standpoint. They've, they've created this humanized um, mouse, the Velocimmune mouse. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the velocimmune mouse makes um, antibodies as an immune response. And you actually generate these massive quantities of these antibodies, which you can then give to an individual early in disease. So rather than waiting for the whole immune system to ramp up and make antibodies, you can mm. jump in. And actually, this person almost acts like they've been vaccinated. They now have all those uh, those antibodies that they need, just B cell response, just antibodies, not yeah. the T cell um, that might come from some of the vaccinations. And, um, you know, when I heard this, um, I think we discussed some really promising data for the monoclonal antibodies. Eli Lilly released a, a preliminary. I think we talked about that like a few hours before it was public knowledge, but it was public knowledge by the time we released it. So I feel better. Um, <laughs> but uh, the idea is this is a great therapy to be given during the first week, during the mm -hmm. viral phase of the illness. And um, we talked on TWIV, and I think this was as early as April, a conversation I had with, um, it was Steve Catani, the chief scientific officer at United Health Group, and one of the um, people at Regeneron about why were you testing these therapies in hospitalized patients when ideally it would be during the first week. Um, fortunately, and this is something we will take away as a benefit from um, COVID-19, is we now have those partnerships. And mm -hmm. so the Amgen trials are being done early on when we think they will work and the data suggests that that was the right time to do it. And that is what our initial impression was that the president got this still during that viral phase. Yeah, and we understand this is a two monoclonal cocktail. And I believe he received eight grams intravenously. Is that correct? That is correct. I'm always entertained that my patients are allowed to have cocktails, uh, but apparently I'm not. <laughs> no, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> not during the work day. <laughs> That's right. Now, it makes perfect sense to, to receive this in the early phase, which is mm -hmm. uh, w where we thought he was on Friday. And, and I believe yeah. he went to Walter Reed to receive that, right? Is that correct? So I believe that may have been given before he went to Walter Reed. Okay. Um, that's at least my understanding. And this is, as we've talked about, um, this isn't something that requires the full support of a hospital. Mm -hmm. um, you could actually just the same way you might put a needle in to get blood drawn, you could put a needle in and inject um, sure. these antibodies. Um, but as I think I mentioned before, some of the antibodies, um, for instance, the 
osteoporosis antibody that I worked on with Amgen, you can give some of these antibodies subcutaneous, just inject under the skin. Mm -hmm. um, and actually some of the upcoming trials that, that you'll see that actually are already in process um, that we're helping to support, um, we'll be using these monoclonal antibodies just injected under the skin. So you don't go to hospital, you don't need someone to find a vein, just you could do it yourself even. Yeah. Now, uh, let's just diverge slightly. So this is a, an experimental drug. It's not even, it doesn't even have an emergency use authorization, right? So what had to happen for him to get this? Who called who? Would his <laughs> Physician calls someone at Regeneron. What do you think happened? <laughs> so my understanding is that um, is that the president actually has a relationship um, with the head of Regeneron. So it was it was mm. sort of a you know potential, and and I'm sure he's aware actually of this therapy, and I'm sure his staff is as well. Okay. So to access these therapies in the context in which we saw, there's an avenue called compassionate use. Mm -hmm. um, and so you can reach out to a company, um, and we do do this in medicine um, quite often uh, where we say, you know, I know this isn't proven, um, but we actually, we're concerned that we're going to have a bad outcome here without this therapy. Um, would you allow us to use it? Mm -hmm. um, and so there is an avenue for doing this. Um, and it's, it's not just restricted to the rich and famous, right? I mean, people were joking today that we're now going to have a, a, a rich COVID algorithm and then the common man mm. COVID algorithm. And that, that's not the case. I mean, this is something um, where, you know, and I think uh, some of the early plasma access was it was a compassionate use mm -hmm. access. Uh, so before you have the evidence, if you're just looking at the picture and you, you know, as a physician still have potentially the freedom to uh, make a decision with your patient, reach out to a company and and get access like this. Um, this, this, of course, opens up the can of worms right now. You know, if the president got this, we, we all want this. Mm. Um, and it does make sense, um, you know, and so just, you know, we still need to do more science, right? And that science is being done. Um, but yeah, th this is one of those therapies that a lot of us thought would make a difference. A lot of us are putting a lot of energy into trying to get that science for. And um, I would not be surprised. This is a stopgap until people get vaccinated because sure. even in the Amgen study um, or no, the Regeneron study we talked about last week, um, if a person already has the antibodies, this therapy doesn't do very much. This is for someone right, who doesn't have right. antibodies. So you get your vaccine, you got your antibodies, you don't need this. You got your own. Now, this this uh, this cocktail had been tested in the in the trial that we discussed, and I think two hundred seventy some odd people, right? Not a lot. A couple of adverse mm -hmm. effects. Was this risky at all? Giving this to the president, do you think? So. I, I really don't think so. I think it was actually reasonable. And, and um, uh, someone actually texted me sort of like right about, actually right about the time I was texting you in the morning, you know, if you were, if you were going to make decisions about therapeutics, you know, what would you recommend? Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I said, I probably would, uh, would actually go ahead and consider one of the monoclonal antibodies or the cocktail, um, as well as early start of okay. remdesivir. So, you know, this is one of those, um, you know, I think we talked about it on the last time, you know, 90% of what we do in medicine, we don't have randomized control trials mm -hmm. to guide us. And it's this weird back and forth, right? Like early on, people are just throwing stuff at people without really thinking it through. Yeah. And yeah. much of medicine is you think it through what makes sense. Okay, we understand the disease. We're in the viral phase. This is a therapeutic that has very low risk of tox toxicity, um, but we do suspect it'll, it'll have a benefit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then actually going ahead. So for me, it actually, okay. it made a lot of sense to do this. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense for people to be throwing therapeutics that it, they don't really think about the phases. You don't think about the disease. Um, and I think you need to do that. You need to say, okay, if you're going to try this, um, what are you trying to accomplish? And does does it make sense that this mm -hmm. has that mechanism? Okay. And, and here, yeah, this has been shown um, to have, um, at least in the limited data we have, um, pretty good ability to block infectivity of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, so, Okay. Now, um, why did he go to the hospital uh, on Friday then? He you think he received this infusion at the White House. Why then did he go to the hospital? So we don't know exactly why he went to the hospital, but one of the things that happened when he got to the hospital was, we'll say, um, the next therapy, not the next therapy we hear about, but the next therapy that sort of um, 
I thought would make sense, which was he he gets started on remdesivir, mm-hmm. right? So this is the RNA polymerase inhibitor. It's another antiviral therapy. It makes sense to be using it um, during the early viral phase. Um, what we think, as we've understood COVID-19 more, is the less virus, the less antigenic stimuli, hopefully the less mm-hmm. of a cytokine storm, the, the easier that second week is going to be. Um, and the remdesivir, the way it's distributed is it's distributed to hospitals. Different hospitals are offered up a, a certain amount. Hospital then selects will take so many. Um, so, And it does make sense to do remdesivir in a hospital setting um, in large part because that's our experience and our comfort level. And, you know, you don't want to you don't want to change the standard operating procedure too much because mm-hmm. when you start doing that is when things start to go south. So um, we didn't, we were not told that's why he went there. That would make sense. All right. This is a drug that's been tested extensively, mostly in hospitalized patients. But as you say, to give it earlier makes a lot of sense because that's when you have a lot of virus uh, around and this could really make a, an impact uh, early on in inhibiting virus reproduction. Yeah. I mean, and that's been our discussion and that's yeah. been our impression and okay. experience to date. So. Yeah. When I heard remdesivir and, and monoclonals, I said, he's not going to have much of an illness. Um, but yeah, then, that's the hope, yeah. But then uh, did he, I understand he receives dexamethasone. Is that correct? Yeah, he did. Um, let, let me, yeah, <laughs> we'll go right to dexamethasone and then we'll backpedal to the all the other things he got. Okay. Um, <laughs> but the, the dexamethasone, um, that was, I think, when people started to wonder about the timing. Yeah. Because, um, you know, the initial impression we had is he's still in the first week. And I think as I communicate with you, oh, he's in the first week. We don't have to worry until, you know, yeah. next weekend. That's when we start getting worried. But the fact that he was already requiring oxygen, as we've heard, the fact mm-hmm. that they went ahead with dexamethasone, that suggests that he's starting to get into that second week. And, and the, the reason I'll say that is a couple things, is we actually think that if you give people steroids during the first week, um, while they have the significant um, viral phase, um, that that can make things worse. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now I'm going to qualify mm-hmm. that. Is that true if the person has received the monoclonal antibodies? and they're on an antiviral. So maybe you've truncated that viral phase. Um, But when we've looked at the studies on dexamethasone, the people who benefit are the people who are starting to require a small amount of oxygen, not people during the first Mm, week. So the suggestion here is that, you know, we're probably past day seven. Right. And I recall that he he was given a chest X-ray or or MRI, I'm not sure what, but they, they said, that also uh, compelled them to start dexamethasone. So what would that be? So probably a CAT scan, probably a chest CAT scan or CT of the chest. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, and you would look at that and instead of seeing nice black, open, clear lungs, you know, that can um, breathe the oxygen in and transfer the oxygen, what you're starting to see is the lungs start to look white. You start to see uh, what a lot of people call the bilateral pneumonia, mm-hmm. uh, the double pneumonia. Um, and, you know, it's at a point like that when you're starting to be concerned that there's a significant amount of lung inflammation, maybe we're not in the first seven days. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe it's time to look at um, an anti-inflammatory approach. So all, all signs so far tells us that he's past the first week. and uh, it, it suggests that at this point, yeah, when yeah. the dexamethasone was, he's probably, probably at day, okay. you know, past day seven, I'll say. Um, so a couple other therapies he got <laughs> that we should talk about. We talked about vitamin D also, coincidentally. Mm-hmm. That's another thing that he um, was given. Um, I thought that was interesting, right? Because what we talked about with vitamin D was that if you had um, a low level, you were more likely to get um, infected. If you had a high level, you were less likely to get infected. Um, so again, we think vitamin D protects you against infection, Um, And then actually, I think this even goes back to our discussions all the way back in April. Um, I'm not sure that vitamin D is something you want to ramp up um, into that second week, right? So, um, you know, everyone should probably make sure their vitamin D level is good going forward. Um, You know, once you get COVID-19, it it might be too late. So try to take that ahead of time. (laughs) Yeah, you may know that Uh, Tony Tony Fauci recently said, you know, he takes vitamin D and he said, it's not a treatment, it's a preventative. It's not good to give uh, in the middle of infection. (laughs) Okay, so Tony Fauci and I are on the same page again. I feel good. <laughs> but I understand he wasn't consulted for this illness. Is that correct? 
Well, you know, I, I we, we've talked about a little, of, you know, Tony Fauci doesn't see a lot of patients, mm-hmm. um, right? So he's not the one you, you grab and say, hey, I'm going to, you know, adjust the dose of this medicine or anything. So, you know, a lot of us in infectious disease have different roles. Um, and, you know, I, I see a lot more patients, um, but Anthony Fauci does a lot more research and management of research portfolios Got it. Got and it. public health. So, yeah, you, you, we each have our little little roles. Mm-hmm. Um, by, uh, by the, the way, Daniel, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. the president's physician, what is his specialty? Yeah, so the the primary guy, right? He's a he's a DO. He's not an MD. Okay. Um, so he's a doc, doctor of um, osteopathic instead of allopathic medicine. Um, and actually, his training, right, was ER training. Okay. Um, so he's he's sort of a prime, you know, he's a primary care. They do have um, a really good infectious disease um, physician on the case who they're consulting with. They've got, you know, intensivists and it really, you know, it takes a team, right? So, you know, the person who's up in front of the microphone as the quote unquote, his doctor, mm-hmm. um, you know, is working with a team of individuals. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. I wanted to know if he had the sense to say, you guys take over because this is not my thing, right? <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he had that sense. Now, how cooperative is his patient? Um, we'll have to see. Right. Um, yeah. And there were some. There were some other therapies thrown in there. You know, zinc, which probably like vitamin D. Maybe if you took it before you got exposed to a virus, but not a lot of yeah. evidence. Um, melatonin, lots of ideas. You know, maybe it helps the president sleep. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, there was a little bit of concern that oh my gosh, there's so many things on his med list. Um, but no, I, I, I don't think that this was fortunately a kitchen sink approach. It sounds yeah. um, it sounds pretty thoughtful. And along the lines of being thoughtful was that, you know, suggestion of steroids. And he's probably not, you know, in that first week. We're starting to get into that, um, mm-hmm. into that second week. Okay. And now today, apparently he's gone back to the White House, right? Yeah, I was just um, just doing an interview, um, you know, before you and I are speaking now. And, and there was a lot of questions. A lot of people are wondering, is that wise? What, what's happening here? You know, a lot of people, you know, reporting they're confused. Um, that's okay. It's a good thing to be confused. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and the conversation I had, to be honest, was that, you know, the, the president going home is not the same thing as you or I going home, Vincent. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, we don't have the same resource, resources <laughs> in our homes that the president has. I mean, um, you know, presidents can actually get um, pretty significant medical care um, in the residence, in the White House. Um, so, you know, um, what what is the what is the criteria we normally use in the hospital before we send someone home, and how might you modify that in this context? Um, so the the normal criteria that I use that I recommend um, is one: um, if a person gets admitted during that second critical week, I want to see the patient through that second critical week before they leave the hospital, um, so that if they do have a turn for the worse, if they start to decompensate, um, that we can be there. Um, you know, that's when even though we do the best therapies, a certain percent of people will have pulmonary emboli, they will mm-hmm. have clots, they will develop bacterial infections. Um, that's why you want to make sure they're going in the right direction before you let them go. Um, you want to make sure their oxygen requirement is below a certain level. So, you know, my normal criteria for discharge to home would be, you know, past day 14 of illness, showing improvement, um, less than um, four liters of oxygen by nasal cannula. Um, but if you think about the president who could have someone, you know, an aide there 24 hours a day, you could deliver a higher amount of oxygen in the residence. I would feel comfortable as a physician knowing that I was discharging someone to, you know, a safer monitored environment. Um, you can get intravenous fluids. Um, I'm sure you can even get chest x-rays and antibiotics and, and all the other things um, mm-hmm. in the residence. So, um you know, my conversation with the reporter was that, you know, you or I, if we're in the hospital, people worry about us and wish us well. But when a president is in the hospital, um, the American public's a little worried. Um, And I think it's, it's encouraging um, to people to hear that um, the president is returning to the White House. And, and I think as long as people are, you know, making um, smart decisions, it's something that can be done safely, but it's a very different um, situation than most of us would be in Mm -hmm. with COVID-19. Daniel, do you know if they are monitoring his viral loads? Well, I'm, I'm sure Anthony Fauci is, right? Because he can access those. No, I do not know. 
<laughs> I mean, it would definitely be fascinating. And we would suspect, at least from the data we have, that the combination of the mm-hmm. of the Regeneron cocktail and the Remdesivir, that those viral loads would have, would have dropped pretty abruptly. And that's what the data... Actually, the primary endpoint in a lot of the monoclonal studies is that really rapid mm-hmm. drop in um, the virus. So I suspect... Um, it's also important, right, for contact issues, right? He was going to be back at the White House. That yeah. doesn't mean he's not contagious, right? Mm-hmm. People, particularly people who end up on steroids, people end up sick enough to be in the hospital, they're potentially conf- contagious yeah. out to yeah. 20 days after symptom onset. Um, so for the president, that presents a little bit of an issue. Um, what we've done for the nursing home uh, patients, people going into facilities, Um, we, in those cases, use a test-based paradigm for ending the isolation um, where we do um, a PCR test that's negative. 24 hours later, we repeat another test. Um, And that's, I'm going to seg into, you know, the testing questions I've been getting a lot of is how could this have happened? Um, Because a lot of people are are asking, you know, here, here's a person who um, can get you know, how can a person get COVID-19 with access to regular testing, right? Um, and we've talked um, a lot on uh, TWIV about testing. And, uh, you know, and I think in several, in several um, uh, episodes in quite detail, quite a bit mm-hmm. of detail, uh, Michael Mina just got a, uh, a piece published in the New England Journal today. Maybe we can post that in your, in your notes. Mm-hmm. Uh, so congratulations there. Um, first author on a perspective piece in the New England Journal, um, just really talking about um, testing and the importance of frequency over sensitivity. And so what what went wrong here, right? We have this um, scenario that at least as it was laid out to us, where all these individuals went to a large gathering in a garden. Um, People were tested before they went in. Um, I think I described, I was invited to one of these parties a few weeks back and, and somehow I couldn't go. I joked with my wife that if they had asked me to come and talk about COVID, somehow my schedule would have cleared up. But to show up for a social event, I'm much too busy. <laughs> so, and it was everyone gets tested and then they're told, oh, you have a negative test. You're all good. Take off the mask, have a drink. It's all, you know, fine here. And there is no test that is 100% um, sensitive. So even if you have a test, you know, pick a number, 80% sensitive, 90% sensitive, we'll be kind. That means 10% of the people who are positive Mm -hmm. are going to make it through. Unless you do a second test, let's say you have 90%. The second test is going to pick up nine of those 10 people you missed. Now you're at 99%. You're still not at 100. So um, the first thing is you can't just do one test. You can't bring, you can't fly hundreds of people from all around the country give them one test and then feel like you're in a virus free zone. That's number one. Two is you've got to actually have people that are going to agree to get tested. You have to know if you're going to be, you know, doing this, that everyone's getting tested. And I think the NHL was sort of a example of success. If you know, everyone's getting tested, if they're not allowed in, unless you have more than one test that is negative, um, you're setting yourself up for failure. So there may have been a situation here where not everyone got that test. And again, it was just one test. So Um, so Daniel, he, um, will he be subject to the same requirements? I know you've talked about before you say that someone is no longer transmitting two consecutive negative PCRs uh, before he can go out and, and, you know, mix with other people again. You know, this is going to be an interesting um, situation, right? I mean, the, the standard public health would be, you know, it doesn't matter that you're the president, you know, we don't want you out there getting other people infected. Uh, We don't know, you know, there may have already been some transmission from the president to other individuals, and we certainly don't want there to be more. Um, You know, you you definitely don't want him to transmit it to his son, who it sounds like, you know, Barron escaped this and some of the other kids. So, you know, from from a, you know, public health standpoint, um, you really don't want to make an exception. There's nothing about being the president that prevents you from spreading virus to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't see why you would make an exception here. Um, I know we have um, an election coming up. You've got to somehow work around that. Um, but yeah, th- you can't expose other people. Okay. All right. I have one more question for you. So he, he, just because he's back at the White House, he's not yet out of the woods. What will they do to monitor him, they'll see if he's recovering. How, uh, will he get any more remdesivir? 
How does that go? So, yeah, yeah. So um, let me finish testing it. Actually, no, let me do this, and then I'm going to finish off the testing okay. comment. So he will get the remdesivir treatment um, is five days. Um, there was a study where they looked at five versus 10. Interesting enough, people who got five did better than people who got 10. So hmm. five, you know, five's enough. Um, you know, it isn't, it isn't always that more is better. <laughs> so you get a loading dose on day one, and then you get a dose on day two, three, four, five, and then you're done with your five days. Um, the steroids we've talked about, the one that was studied um, was a 10-day, six milligrams a day of the dexamethasone, but nothing's etched in stone there. You can always adjust the length there, but that can be done orally. So um, if they want to continue the dexamethasone, there's no reason that can't mm -hmm. be just given as an oral pill. Um, if oxygen required, that can be given. Um, you would you would want to follow uh, daily blood work um, on an individual with COVID nineteen, um, and the most important thing that um, that a lot of us track is the level of the neutrophils, the level of the lymphocytes, and and looking at that neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Um, but also you want to keep track of the D dimer, um, you know, because there is this clotting risk, both a macro and a microvascular clotting risk, um, and uh, yeah, so. Okay. Is there anything I missed or we missed, Daniel? Um, yeah, I'm just going to finish off the testing thing because um, okay. I think this is important too. I think, you know, we, we've talked a lot about therapeutics and hopefully this helps people with therapeutics. Um, but at this point, um, you know, a test is not so good that you have to forget about everything else. Um, so in one of these situations, I understand that testing was going on, um, but the testing is not foolproof. Uh, the testing also only tells you about one point in time and cannot predict the future. I think I use the pregnancy test as an example, you know, um, someone, you know, you and your wife are, are trying to conceive and the next morning she does a pregnancy test and it's negative. And so now you're in the doghouse and, you know, and, and she's trying, your wife tries to explain, she's smarter than we are that no, it's two weeks before it becomes positive. Um, and, and just like my wife, I say two weeks, that's, that's just way too long. Well, it's biology. Um, so, you know, a test today doesn't tell you about tomorrow, doesn't tell you about the next day. So again, um, frequency um, is the way to do this. Um, I use the, I think the analogy, my daughter got a pregnancy test before college. Now I don't have to worry for four years. My wife tried to explain that wouldn't work. And I was like, four years, I can't worry for four years. I need to know now. Um, yeah, you, you may need to know now, but um, tests don't predict the future. Um, and the test is only as good as the person performing it. You know, if they don't get a good sample, if they don't run the machine properly. Um, so um, just because you are doing testing, don't throw caution to the wind. Um, you got you to look at the other, the other modalities as well. So masks. Um, I think I have my mask here. I'm going to um, just finish with my closing quote. Masks are cool. <laughs> and so you can see my mask there. Nice. Um, so, you know, even if you've got testing, all this other stuff in place, um, masks are cool. Wear a mask. Be safe. All right. That's our presidential COVID-19 report with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thanks so much, Daniel. Oh, it's my pleasure. Everyone be safe. And I wish the president well. I hope he gets through this. That's a special episode of TWIV. You can find the show notes at microbe dot tv slash twiv if you like what we do here on twiv consider supporting us you are our only means of support you are listeners you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.blog i'd like to thank the american society for virology and the american society for microbiology for their support of twiv and ronald jenkies for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.